When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said to himself, Shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, who is ninety years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. God said, No, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his offspring after him. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father twelve princes, and I will make him into a great nation." But I will establish my covenant with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. When he had finished talking with him, God went up from Abraham. Then Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all those born in his house or bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and he circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very day, as God had said to him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very day, Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised, and all the men of his house, those born and in the house, those bought with money from a foreigner, were circumcised with him. Well, good morning, church. Before we jump into the message this morning, I just wanted to take a moment to express appreciation for a couple of matters. First of all, uh, last weekend, my wife uh, kind of vented on Facebook about the struggles we were having getting our son MJ uh, vaccinated. Uh, We wanted to get him inoculated before the wedding in a few weeks for his safety and just been running into all kinds of bureaucratic red tape. And so she put the call out and uh, wow, uh, did you guys ever tap into your networks and start making calls? And by Wednesday afternoon, we had an appointment set at uh, Rockledge Hospital. And, uh, but then uh, Wednesday night, uh, one of you guys called and said, Psst, 
I talked to the manager of the pharmacist at a certain place, and they have an extra dose and said, if you come down right now, they'll give it to him. And so Wednesday night, we ran down there, and uh, we got him inoculated, and, uh, and they actually had an, another dose, and they said, well, you look like you need it. So they gave it to me too, so, uh, <laughs> and they were right. So thank you, uh, just for the, all of your, pers- so many of you were praying and, and tapping into <clears throat> your networks, and it was uh, just the Lord worked through that. Secondly, a few weeks ago, uh, one morning in my office, and Jonathan's office, uh, a couple of elders and some deacons showed up uh, unannounced. And uh, apparently you guys behind our backs through your small groups and all that, uh, you participated in uh, a, a, a program that the National Association of Evangelicals was running and you know, kind of basically bless your pastor and say thank you to them. And uh, so you sneakers uh, put together some really nice gifts and uh, on behalf of Jonathan and I, our families have really enjoyed that. And thank you so much for your love and that expression of appreciation to us. And I hope that you know that we return it right back to you. We love you guys greatly. Well, it's uh, in our chapter here in chapter 17. Uh, just kind of catch us up, right? Uh, we've been in uh, this series on the life of Abraham now. This is the fifth message. And uh, we've seen a new call and a new test Uh, A new land last week, a new covenant, and this morning uh, we're going to see a new sign. It's been 24 years between chapter 17, the new sign, and that initial call that was put upon Abraham's life. 24 years has transpired since Genesis 12, probably 23, 22 years since what, uh, what we saw last week in Genesis 15, where the covenant was inaugurated, has now transpired. And if you remember, in those chapters, God made some incredible promises to Abraham that he was going to make from Nate Abraham uh, a seed that would come forth. And in that seed, which we know is Jesus, all the nations of the world would be blessed. That Abraham was going to have so many descendants that it would be impossible for a human being to identify and count them all. That the land that he had been brought to, what we now know as Palestine or Canaan, would be Abraham's and his descendants as an everlasting inheritance, right? And then to ratify the inauguration of the covenant last week, we saw that great scene where the animals were torn apart and God himself walked through the pieces of those animals signifying that if he did not bring about what this covenant, the covenant was promising to Abraham, then he himself should be ripped apart because he was clearly not worthy of being worshiped if this is what occurred, right? And so that's where we left off last week. They're promised a son, and now it's been more than 11 years. They wait. In chapter 15 to chapter 16, they wait for 11 years. No son. Sarah finally, you know, hatches a scheme, and she brings to Abraham her handmaiden, Hagar. And as was the practice back in that day in the, in the Near East, This was something that would be commonly done if a person did not have a natural heir, a man and a wife, they would bring in a surrogate and hope that an heir would be produced. And sure enough, they have a son, Abraham and Agar. His name is Ishmael. And it's clear, as we saw just a few moments ago, as Sandy was finishing up chapter 17, that Abraham was quite fond of his son Ishmael. God promises him a son, another son, and he says, well, what about Ishmael? Why don't we just use Ishmael as the, as the promise? And God says, no. He's clearly very fond of Ishmael. It's been 13 years since the birth of Ishmael. It's been 24 years since God walked through the pieces of the animal, making this, inaugurating this covenant. And now we come to chapter 17. Abraham is 99 years old, right? He's looking at the end of his life. He thinks he has it figured out, but he doesn't. And so here in chapter 17, God finalizes this covenant that he inaugurated back in chapter 15. Now, there is a lot in this chapter. So yesterday, about 2.30, I called an audible, right? The audible is, this week we are looking at a new sign. And next week, we are looking at a new sign, okay? So I just said, you know, if I would wear you out 
if I did justice to the chapter and tried to put it all into one message. So we're going to break it up into two weeks instead. So let's begin with the first few verses where we see the creator of the covenant in verses one to three. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face. The opening words of this covenantal renewal reveal details about God himself and about how Abraham should understand his place within the covenant. So for example, in the first time in scripture, a new name for God is being used, El Shaddai, name that was made into a popular song many, 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 maybe 40 years ago, right? El Shaddai, the omnipotent God, the almighty God, the powerful, all-powerful God. In other words, he begins by introducing himself as really the one who has the power to bring about what he's promised for a 90-year-old barren womb. He can bring out a child of the promise, Isaac. He is this almighty God who has the the power and the right to make this covenant and to finalize this covenant with Abraham. This is his covenant with Abraham. In this chapter, 11 times, God says, I will. He says nine times, my covenant. This is his covenant where he's offering to Abraham a way for them to be in relationship with one another. And he puts in these opening verses, basically a summary stipulation. I want to be in in covenant with you, Abraham. Here's how it happens. Walk before me and be blameless. You and your descendants, this covenant, we will be in covenant with one another, but it requires that you walk before me and that you are blameless. Listen, these opening words have serious implications for all of us this morning. Right? First of all, to be in relationship with God, we have to recognize that this only occurs when we um, uh, accept and obey what he says to us and about himself. Uh, this, this phrase, walk before me and be blameless. How should we understand this phrase? How would Abraham have understood this phrase? Well, that phrase, walk before me, comes as language that was used in the treaties of that day, they were known as suzerain treaties, um, basically covenants between a powerful God, a powerful king, and a lesser king, maybe a conquered king or a, a conquered people. And the powerful king, the all-powerful king would come in and he would make a treaty with the people. And in that treaty, there would be this command to walk before him, okay? This, this type of language, And what was he getting at? It's the the idea that he had the right to demand of the lesser party that they adopt his agenda, that they uh, submit themselves to him through a, a wholehearted commitment that was then demonstrated through faithful service and obedience to him. It was essentially, when he says, you will walk before me, he's essentially saying, you will commit yourself to me and adopt my agenda for your life for my kingdom, for my plans. You'll orient your life around me and you'll obey me. This is what it means to walk before him and to do so blamelessly. Now, blamelessly doesn't mean sinlessly, right? We know that Abraham was a sinner. All of us are sinners, the scriptures teach us. The idea here is that he would be wholly devoted to his king, that he would be a person of integrity. He would live with integrity and authenticity before God. This is, this is strong implications for us. If we're going to have a covenantal relationship with God, this idea of walking before him and being blameless, man, that's, that's a great summary of what God calls of his people. And then another implication in this passage is that we'll never be in relationship with God unless we believe what he reveals about himself. We'll never have a covenantal relationship with God if we don't accept and obey his terms and if we don't believe that he is who he said he is as he's revealed himself in his word. You see, this is difficult for people today in our culture because we live in a very individualistic culture where everyone creates 
their own version of God. We, we project upon God what is most comfortable to us about the God that we want, right? And so we live in a culture that essentially is filled, and we do it too as Christians, by the way. As Christians, we will, we will highlight the things that we like in the Bible, and we will kind of ignore the parts that maybe are, make us uncomfortable. And this is the God we worship. And this is called idolatry. This is raking God in our own image. And this is an issue. This is a huge issue. And it will, it will prohibit us from ever fully enjoying covenantal relationship with God if this is the way we live our life. Ian Dugan, in his writings on the book of Genesis, says this, the real question is not what you would like God to be like, but what he is really like. And he has revealed himself as the God who has made a covenant with his people. When the great king comes and offers to establish a covenant with you, you really only have two choices. You can accept the covenant relationship on his terms and receive its benefits, or you can refuse it and face the consequences. This finalization of the Abrahamic covenant, it's really following this template that you see in the ancient world of the suzerain treaties. You see this throughout the Old Testament. What we know is the Ten Commandments is yet another manifestation of this kind of ancient covenant and treaty. It's the same template that is in play here. You have this strong, conquering king who enters into an agreement with a lesser, conquered people. When the lesser person enters into that covenant, that person is giving up control of their life to that strong king. It's not an agreement of equals. It is the superior to the lesser that's taking place. And when the lesser gives up control of their life, they are essentially placing themselves under the protection and the blessing and the rule of that stronger king. And in those treaties, as they would start out, we saw it in chapter 15, we see it here in chapter 17, they start out with the king introducing himself. That's what he does here in verse one. This is what he does in Exodus chapter 20, right? The 10 commandments. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the nation, out of Egypt and out of your slavery. They start with this announcement of who the omnipotent king is and God does this. And then after that announcement would then become a section of obligations and stipulations, the conditions of the covenant. And this is what you begin to see in verse four with the essence of the covenant that we have here. Now, I'm gonna switch to a different translation than the ESV, which we read earlier this morning, we typically use in our church because other translations like the New King James Version actually translate the underlying Hebrew in a way that helps you see this covenantal structure that's in place where there's obligations on the powerful king's part and there's obligations on the lesser party's part. And you see this in some of the other translations. So for example, in the New King James, it begins in verse four, with God's obligations. He says, as for me, behold. In other words, okay, here's my obligations to you in this covenant. My covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you're a stranger, all the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. That last little phrase, I will be their God, uh, kind of a, a, rep a repetition of the previous statement, I will be your God. That little phrase, I will be God to you, really summarizes God's obligations in the Abrahamic covenant to him and to his descendants. In that little phrase, it's a, it's a pregnant phrase. It is a phrase filled with meaning. 
So for example, he's, by saying, I will be God to you, he's saying to Abraham, I'm going to give you a new identity. Through my covenant with you, you will now have a new identity. Uh, you notice in this chapter, even though we in this series have been calling him Abraham, in the scriptures, until this point, he's been called Abram. And now he's called Abraham. You see, again, in the ancient world, when this type of a treaty was executed, especially between a powerful king and a, and a conquered king, to show his power, to show his authority, to show his might and rule over that king and kingdom, it was not uncommon for the conquering king to rename the conquered king. So those of you who maybe you've read the historical books of the Old Testament, when you get centuries from now and, you know, Nebuchadnezzar comes in and he conquers Judah, right? The king at that time, is it, is it Jehoiakim? Is it Zedekiah? I mean, there's all these different names of kings. One book will have one set of names. Another book will have another set of names. They're all the same people, but Nebuchadnezzar renamed them. He gave them an identity, a new identity. He's basically saying, you are no longer the person that you once were. You're now who I say you are, and I am setting a new trajectory for your life, and this name reflects that new trajectory. Okay? That's, that's what would occur in the ancient world. This is what God does to Abraham right here. He gives him a new na a name, a new identity. You were Abraham, which meant exalted father. Now you're, you are Abram, exalted father. You're now Abraham, the father of multitudes. And in doing this, God is demonstrating the new trajectory of Abraham's life. And don't miss this. He's committing himself. God is committing himself to the course of action and the path of action that is necessary to bring this about, to make him the father of of a multitude of nations. He gives him a new identity and then he clarifies the inheritance. He says, it's going to be an everlasting inheritance for you, for your descendants who come after you, who obey the conditions of the covenant. And then in that phrase, I will be God to you, is the promise of security that he will provide protection. Now, in this day and age, security was very much, maybe even kind of like our day and age, tied to assets, to the ownership of, in this case, land. And we, we, we understand that, right? We, those who, we always say, you know what, you need to own your own home. Why? Because there's a sense of security there, right? And so what God does here is he makes, he says, I'll be God to you. I'm going to be the source of all of your security and the way he does this is he speaks to Abraham's need for protection, for personal welfare, for prosperity, for you know, long-lasting security. And so the promise of the land touches on this need. God gives Abraham and his descendants ownership of this land. It's important, though, for us to see that not only is this a tangible provision for their security, but in order for them to enjoy it and to possess that security that the land represents, they have to faithfully follow and obey the Lord. Walk before me and be blameless. And these are conditions that are being put in place. And then finally, what you see in that phrase, I will be God to you, is that God ensures that Abraham will have a long-lasting posterity and lineage. I didn't read it just now, but if you drop down to verses 15 to 21, he addresses the whole idea of Sarah, right? Sarai, and then he changes her name to Sarah, which are really kind of both versions in some way mean princess, right? So all of you ladies named Sarah, you're, you're a princess, okay? Uh, but so he tells, hey, Sarah, she's going to have a child, and not just any child, this is a child who's important in that whole promise that goes back to Genesis chapter three, that the seed of a woman will one day come who will crush the head of the serpent. So it is a significant child and it's not Ishmael. Let's pause for a moment. Do you see any correlation between how God is interacting with Abraham here and the obligations that he puts upon himself in the Abrahamic covenant? with how he has acted towards us in the new covenant? 
I mean, think about it. The all-powerful God, the only person who could do this through the new covenant when we trust in Jesus Christ has the authority and the power to say, you're no longer guilty of sin before me. Instead, I declare you to be a righteous person. And in that declaration of righteousness, I'm going to give you a new name, Christian. You're now a Christian. That's your identity. It's in Jesus Christ. And this identity brings with us an inheritance like Abraham's, an everlasting, eternal inheritance of life with the promise of security. That when we have been placed within the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, no one can ever take us out of those hands. No one can ever remove us from the family of God. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And then... He gives us this posterity, this lineage by, in some cases, those who maybe lost family and that the movement into the new covenant, he says, I'm gonna give you a family that you can't even begin to number. It'll be like the sands of the sea. And in Revelation, we see this scene where we are gathered together with our eternal, invisible family that we can't see right now, but God sees. And it's his church and it's his people through all the ages and we join in and this is our lineage. The way God works towards Abraham is exactly the way God works towards us in the new covenant. Remember, in the old covenant, the new covenant is concealed. In the new covenant, the old covenant is revealed. And this is exactly what we have going on here. We do not serve a God church that is schizophrenic that has split personalities, and he acts one way towards one group of people, the Jews in the Old Testament, and he acts a different way towards Gentiles in the New Testament. No, we do not worship a schizophrenic God. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever. He is this God of grace who brings his grace to Abraham in this covenant, and in the same way, he brings it to us. The only difference is what side of the cross are we on? This is God's obligation. I will be God to you. Abraham's obligation is pretty simple. You shall keep my covenant, right? And God said to Abraham, as for you, now it's your obligations, conditions, and stipulations. Abraham, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Dr. Sidney Greenos, in his writings on the book of Genesis, makes a great observation how the Abrahamic covenant there's a significant difference in the Abrahamic covenant and in the, um, the, the covenant with Noah. In the covenant with Noah, the sign of the covenant uh, was the rainbow, and it was a sign that was something that God did to indicate his commitment to us. In the Abrahamic covenant, humanity indicates their commitment to God through the application of the sign of the covenant. This is what it means in, this, in these first initial verses to walk before God and to be blameless before him or to keep the covenant through circumcision. I mean, one obligation to circumcise the males. Now guys, I, I've joked with some others that I was tempted for all of you kinesthetic learners this morning to plant flint knives throughout the congregation so you could really grasp the the gravity of this sign, but I didn't do that. Uh, But it is, is it's a serious uh, thing that God is calling for here, right? And and it may seem like, okay, all all I have to do is, you know, they have to be circumcised. And now from my on, the the boys are circumcised and the, the women were brought into that through the oversight of the males and their family. So they were included in the blessings of this Abrahamic covenant through that that headship that was implied through the the men of the family. But this obligation is actually a very loaded obligation. There's more going on here than just simply, okay, just get the sign. The, the, The Jews, through the decades and through the centuries, they would reduce it to, okay, I just get the sign and now I'm good. 
That's not what God is saying at all. Dr. Greedenhus writes this. He says, in contrast to God's covenant at Sinai, which had 10 covenant stipulations, the Decalogue, the 10 commandments, here there's only one covenant stipulation. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Why just one stipulation? Derek Kidner explains, to be committed was all. Circumcision was God's brand. The moral implications could be left unwritten until Sinai, and that's where the Ten Commandments were issued, for one was pledged to a master first, only secondarily to a way of life. But then Dr. Green News makes a great observation. He says, but in the very next chapter, that way of life is already summarized, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. In other words, by accepting and applying the sign of the covenant, circumcision, which was the essential obligation of the Abrahamic covenant, that sign had deeper meaning. It meant to walk before the Lord and be blameless, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. So that brings us to the final point that we'll cover this morning, or at least part of it, the sign of the covenant itself. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And to spare you the discomfort, I mean, how many times does this passage talk about being circumcised in the foreskin and the flesh of your foreskin? It's just over and over, it's reiterated, it's pounding at home, right? This is the sign of the covenant. So we need to pause for a moment. And this is really where we will stop here uh, this morning and we'll pick up next week. What does it mean when the Bible uses the word sign? We need, to, we need to understand what this concept of a sign means. It's important, okay? So let's just, we're gonna start it this week right now and then uh, we're gonna close out and we'll pick up next week, okay? So what does a sign do? You ready? This is deep. Here it is. It signifies. You ever notice that? In the word signify is the word sign, right? A sign signifies. In other words, it informs us. It announces something to us. It symbolizes or it illustrates an important reality that we need to understand. We need to get our heads around and our hearts around it. So several years ago, in 2016, uh, on my sabbatical, I was, uh, I was camping in North Carolina, mountains of North Carolina. And there's a section in North Carolina called the Tail of the Dragon. How many of you have ever driven the Tail of the Dragon? Yeah, yeah. All right, now let me ask you a more important question. How many of you drove it, you know, like you stole it? Raise your hand. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this, this thing is incredible, right? And I actually had a picture. I couldn't find it. I was driving an SUV and somebody took a picture of my face coming around one of those curves. And, you know, I, had, I, was, I was in my Richard Petty moment, right? You know, that kind of thing. Uh, great, great stretch of highway. Now look, you look at that sign. What does it tell you? Yeah, somebody said, slow down, <laughs> right? For some of you, it said, speed up, right? But for all of us, what does it say? There's curves ahead, right? In fact, this sign is even more explicit. Uh, it says for the next 11 miles, and there's another sign that says there's like 319 curves in the next 11 miles. That's why it's so much fun. You gotta go drive it, you know? So, Bob, you gotta get your charger up there. You know, it's great. So, so we understand that this sign, listen, is the concern about the curves? Is that the deeper reality that they're warning you about here? Oh, there's curves ahead. Is that it? What's the deeper reality? Death. If you aren't careful, okay? You know, you need to slow down, as Rick said, and be careful because you're entering into a dangerous stretch of highway. So the sign, it announces a deeper reality. The, the surface sign isn't the point. It's the, it's the reality behind the sign that you need to pay attention to. So then the question becomes, what did circumcision signify, right? What reality 
did it inform God's people about? How did it help Abraham and his descendants to better understand who God is and what this covenant was all about and what it was requiring? Okay? There's five things. We're not going to do all five. We're just going to do two. Say thank you, Jerry. Okay. See? I, and then we have applications to make. That's why, I mean, even the Pentecostals would have beat us to Cracker Barrel if I had done all of this chapter in one, in one message today. Okay? That's why we're breaking it apart. So here, let me give you the first one. First of all, circumcision signified membership in the visible covenant family and participation in God's blessings on his people. It signified that you were now a member of the visible family of God. And as a result of that membership, you were allowed to participate in all of God's blessings upon that visible covenant family. It says in verse 12, he who's eight days old among you shall be circumcised every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. In other words, let's just, let's just so we're clear, if you did not receive the sign of the covenant, if you were born in the family line of Abraham or you were in the household of, because they had servants and slaves back then and so you, were, you came under the authority of that head of household and you were male and you did not have circumcision applied to you, then you were not in the family of God. You were outside the covenant family. You had no right to expect any of the blessings of this covenant to be applied to you and to enjoy it. So the sign joined you to the visible family. Second and last this morning, circumcision is a physical outward sign which points us to a deeper spiritual reality. The sign points to something, right? The curves point to death, slow down. Circumcision is pointing us to a much deeper spiritual reality. And what is that spiritual, that deeper spiritual reality? The scripture makes it clear. It's pointing us to the fact that everyone needs the spiritual filth and decay and uncleanness of their lives to be cut away and to be removed. And this is something that only God can do through Jesus Christ. We, we see this in the earliest pages of the Old Testament. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, the Lord is speaking. God is speaking to his people, and, and this passage, of course, Jesus will refer back to as the greatest commandment, right? The Lord your God, he says, will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You have a problem, he says. Humanity, you're unclean. You don't just need the circumcision of the flesh. You need the circumcision of the heart. This transcends our sex, male, female. This is every human being. We are born dead in sin. All have sinned, fall short of the glory of God. We are all dead in our trespasses and sins. And he says, this must be cut away. This dead heart has to be circumcised made clean. Later through the prophet Jeremiah, he will say this to the people of Israel, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. Wait a second, Jerry. You just said, that only God can circumcise. Our, this says circumcise yourselves. So this is the, the language of the Abrahamic covenant. Walk before me and be blameless. Remember, the sign of circumcision is, is a different sign than the Noah co Noahic covenant. The Noahic covenant, God just puts the sign out there every time we see it. It's God doing it with the Abrahamic covenant, with the new covenant, right? Through faith, we participate in this covenant. And we come to God walking blamelessly before him, humbly 
confessing who we are. Uh, listen, it says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord, remove the foreskins of your heart. Even the very desire to come to God, to have this happen in your life, here's the paradox of the gospel. That's already the evidence that God is working in your heart, circumcising your heart. And so the question that we conclude with this morning is this, what kind of heart do you have? Do you have a heart, that, to use the language of the Old Testament, that has been circumcised by God? Do you have a heart that has been cleansed by God? Do you have a heart that has been made new by God? If you don't, then I want to encourage you, even this morning, to begin to pray and ask God to give you this new heart. If you are here and you say, you know what, I, I think I have this, I want this heart, I want to be made clean before God, then I want to encourage you, come speak with our spiritual counselors and, and advisors after the service. The very fact that a human being says, yes, I want to be clean before God. I want God to come into my life. I want to follow after God is evidence that he's already in your life. Participate in this call on your life. Respond and trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to look at this passage of Scripture Lord, as we dig in even more next week and we, we look at more aspects of this sign and who it's applied to and, and how it applies to us in 21st century America, would you give us a, a deeper appreciation for how you have been working out your redemptive plan through your people through the centuries? Would you give us a deeper appreciation of how indebted we are, even as 21st century Christians, to our forefathers in the faith like Abraham. Would you help us to see, Lord, your grace in our lives as we see your grace being worked out in their lives. And may it ultimately conclude with those of us who don't know you, trusting in you, Lord Jesus, and those of us who do, praising and worshiping you with a truer, more grateful heart. In your name we pray, amen.